Welcome to Armored Gaming, this is Panther Al. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Now as you know we have a new patch coming out in War Thunder and when I was looking at the various notes and dev vlogs, a little bit of an inspiration came to me. Now as you know one of the vehicles that is coming out is the Vickers Independent A1E1 tank. It's a multi-turreted monstrosity, uh, rather large and rather interesting looking. And in the dev blog comments somebody made a comment in passing that uh, really gave me an idea of what we can do a video on. And this is that video. And that is the Vickers story. Now Vickers is a company of pretty long standing in England. Uh, they're well renowned for its uh, long standing interest in both engineering and steel manufacture of all sorts. Uh, they were founded in Sheffield by an Edward Vickers and his father-in-law George Naylor back in 1828. And they made something of a name for themselves right out the gate. A small one to be sure, but a name uh, basically in the steel industry and particularly making church bells. Now in the 1850s, his sons became the driving force in the company. And between their leadership, and not just engineering, but as well as marketing and purely technical leadership, especially when it came to recruiting and keeping top-notch talent, that allowed that company to really blow up and become what we know nowadays as Vickers. Now they first got into the military business in the late 1880s. They started making armor plate for the Royal Navy. And then in 1890, they first started making their first artillery pieces. In 1897, they picked up another company, a fairly small one at the time, but one they thought had a future in the military business. And because they picked up that company, they decided they had to change their name. And that name became Vickers, Sons, and Maxim. Yes, that Maxim. They got in the shipbuilding business at the same time as well. They produced the Royal Navy's first submarine, the Holland One, and was a major manufacturer of military equipment both during and before the First World War. Now, at that time, they really had a name for being that one-stop shop for anybody who wanted to build a military. You needed guns, machine guns, tank, uh, artillery pieces, warships, you name it. Vickers made it, and they would sell it to you, no problem. Even better, for a lot of countries' point of view, is for the right amount of money, they'll sell you the rights to make it yourself. Now, after World War I, they noticed that aviation was a big deal. So they started looking around for aviation companies to snap up. Uh, one of them was Armstrong Whitworth. And then they picked up a company called Supermarine. Yes, of Spitfire fame. And they added aircraft to their portfolio as well. Now, after the Second World War in the 60s, they merged with Bristol, Hunting Aircraft, and English Electric and formed the British Aircraft Corporation. And that was also well known for making some pretty good jets of that era, at least until nationalization came around. Now, once nationalization was brought down, um, the Vickers companies, and there were quite a few at that time, were either bought by or they sold out to or they purchased other companies. They went through a lot of changes, especially in the 80s and 90s, until they all pretty much were bought out by a company called BAE Systems. And anybody who knows anything about modern military equipment these days, they know about BAE. They're well known for their ability to make some very top-notch equipment, which is awfully appropriate considering that a large part of BAE is pretty much, well, Vickers. As you can see, it's not exactly the most mobile thing in the world. Uh, steering is definitely bad. And as you saw in the earlier clips, the actual crew is kind of tightly packed. Imagine you get any shots on the inside of this thing, you're going to kill a lot of the crew. Now I'm trying to chase down the tank over here. I'm not even going to waste my time shooting those guys over there. Not with this gun. Is that him? Yep, that's him. Now, the funny thing is, like I'm going to mention later on here, is I can see why people thought this was a design worth stealing. I mean, yes, we know it's a failure now. And yes, everybody pretty much knew it was a failure pretty much after they built the thing, uh, especially before World War II. But at the same time, Vickers had a reputation of building some pretty good stuff. I mean, they built good tanks, so I can see why somebody would say this was the way to go. I disagree, but I think that's more hindsight than anything else. And yeah, this three pounder is garbage. That or I'm garbage, one of the two. Which honestly could be either way. Then you tell it could be better performance wise. 
we can tell that the uh, dispersion of the gun is abysmal. But what can you do? But uh, yeah, we'll go over some notes here and uh, talk a little bit about this tank design. Give you an idea of why it was built, who built it, and why it was such an influent, influential tank design. I mean, it really was. I mean, yeah, it was a failure, but it was really an important failure. Now, this particular tank, the uh, A1E1 Independent, now this was built in 1926. It was built more or less to the request of the War Department as an experiment in how a heavy tank should be built. Now, it was based off the idea of a land battleship, a multi-turreted affair, a central turret armed with a 3-pound or 47-millimeter gun, and four smaller turrets, each armed with a 30 caliber Vickers machine gun. Now, as to design, it was pretty much, after some time, considered to be something of a failure. Now, it was developed by Vickers, a company that was already making a name for itself as a top-notch tank designer. It gathered a lot of attention by pretty much everybody. Now, at the time itself, the design was revolutionary. It was very well armored for its day with up to 28 millimeters of armor. All its weapons were in turrets, and, they all, and it had a pretty good turn of speed for its size. It made, like I said, quite the impression. It wasn't without its faults. It only had a range of about 90 to 95 miles, and during that time it was consuming motor oil at about a rate of 5 gallons an hour. Now the brakes were either total rubbish, or when they put in a new design of brakes, they were so good that if you hit them too hard, it would actually separate the suspension from the hull. Not a bad thing. Now, even though it never went into production and was pretty much seen as a white elephant by the War Department, it influenced everybody else. Now, the Germans and the Soviets both stole this design, and they copied it to various degrees. Um, the Germans, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation here, and I do apologize, with the uh, Nubar Frugzug heavy tank, and again, I apologize for that, and the Soviets with the T-28 and the T-35. Now, the Germans pretty much came to the same conclusion fairly quickly. After about four or five examples of it, they decided this was really wasn't the way to go, that a single turreted tank was the better idea. Uh, the Soviets, however, went all in on the T-28 and the T-35. And to be fair, you really can't blame them for that. Now, while they did steal this particular design, they also purchased the rights to another Vickers design. They paid hard cash for the Vickers six-ton tank and the license to actually produce them. Now, in Soviet service, this was known as the T-26, and it is currently the reserve tank in the Russian tech tree. And it's not a bad tank. Um, it has about the same amount of armor as the Independent, has a 45mm gun in a turret, and compared to everybody else's tanks at the time, it was astounding. I mean, really. I mean, take a look at the Panzer II. It was armed with a 20mm cannon. Uh, take a look at the other early design tanks they were armed with either machine guns or again small caliber cannon 37 millimeter being a typical size uh, two pound in the case of the british so the vickers six ton was a winner for the soviets and they knew it was a winner and when they used it in the spanish civil war they got even further evidence that this vickers design was astounding so i can understand why they thought that this a1e1 concept would work out very well for them so i understand why they went and built a ton of them now, I think even the Soviets realized, especially right before the Second War kicked off, that it was a mistake. I mean, they stopped production, they were moving into other directions, either the A-20 that turned into the T-34 or the KV series. Um, but like I said, I think for the longest time they thought this was the way to go because all the evidence was seemingly pointing that direction based off of their experiences. But it did go nowhere. It was a bad design. It really did not work out for them. But we'll go into some of the other little details, especially the other Vickers tanks, particularly the T-26, and why Vickers is such an interesting company. One of the biggest reasons for that, in my opinion, is, like I said, is they were specialists in pretty much all of the various ways you can build war machines at the time. I mean, yes, in this case, we're looking at their tanks. But remember what I said earlier is Vickers is also known for their planes. I mean, at the time, they were building the supermarine spitfire so you know you had those those tanks and then of course you have obviously the spitfire and this is the same company that designed the tanks we were just looking at designed this well not the same people but you get what i'm saying here so vickers 
was the super conglomerate of its day. I mean, everybody makes fun of what's good for America is good for GM and vice versa. Well, you could say the same of Vickers at the time. I mean, Vickers was a tremendously huge company that made its name building everything a military could need or want or desire. And the T-26, like I said, was perhaps their biggest winner. I mean, this really was an astounding tank for its day. And when they went to the Independent and everybody started copying it with the T-35, T-28, and this here, you can understand why they were doing so. I mean, Vickers had a good reputation for making outstanding vehicles, outstanding tanks, good planes, good warships, good submarines, you name it. Vickers made it, and it was good. So the fact that everybody jumped on this bandwagon is understandable. Like I said, the Germans figured out pretty quickly this was not the way to go. I don't want to say it's because they had a better grasp of armored warfare or not, but they more or less did because they realized this was a mistake before the Russians did. But be that as it may, I see where they were going. Vickers, like I said, is a super conglomerate. It had their fingers in every pie under the sun. Nothing bad about that, really. It's just what they did. Um, I mean, Vickers, like I said, they were very big in tanks. Um, independent, obviously. Um, even though I don't believe this was a Vickers design, uh, they were heavily influencing this here. So, you know, anything that they did touched everything else. So Vickers is that company. Vickers is the 600-pound gorilla in the room in the interwar period. Had their fingers doing everything. They were building tanks, planes, ships, you name it. Vickers machine guns used everywhere. Every, every British plane has a Vickers machine gun, for crying out loud, just about. Um, your independent Vickers, your T-26 Vickers, T-28 Vickers, T-35 Vickers, even though the T-28 and T-35 were designed by the Russians and the Soviets. But the point is, is it was based off a of stolen Vickers design. So you can honestly say all these things were Vickers products. So the early war was defined by what Vickers did. So that, to me, that's why I think Vickers... It is really the most interesting company story of the interwar period leading into the war itself it is because they were so influential. They, they were everywhere. Anywhere you looked, you saw them. I mean, Vickers built the Challenger of modern day. So, you know, they've been around the block. But that's my first two cents on what we're getting in this patch, especially when it comes to A1E1. Am I going to buy it? Of course I'm going to buy it. As you can tell, what haven't I bought but I'm going to buy it. I'm probably going to take it out in a few matches because it looks fun. I mean, yes, it's not very good. Yes, you got more machine guns than you really do anything with, and you only have a three-pounder gun that, as you saw, wasn't exactly the most accurate gun in the world. But it looks like it's going to be fun. I mean, you think about it. you got a big old tank that is actually fairly quick for its size. I mean, right now it's battle rating 1.3. I don't know how long it's going to stay there. So I imagine we're going to have a little bit of fun with that. And uh, once we get it live... I'm going to get some Eagles. I'm going to go ahead and buy it. And we'll see how it works out. I think it's going to be fine. Um, I don't know what camouflages it comes with. That's actually... Well, you can't tell because, well, I don't have it. In this but anyways, there we go. The Independent. That's my two cents. That's my thinking, the, the story behind it. And I hope you enjoy this. This has been Panther Owl with Armored Gaming. I do hope you enjoyed. If you like please click that like button. If you want to subscribe, please do. Every little bit helps. And until then, you guys have fun.